Welcome to the podcast for Westside A Jesus Church. We hope this teaching encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus. One thing about you guys that I think I should share, I've been connected a little bit because we have some roots, Southern Oregon roots, in the same church, so I kind of knew Phil a little bit and John Mark a bit. So I've been watching Solid Rock, now West Side, for 14 years. And what you guys are doing is really amazing. That you're setting some things in motion here that's affecting culture really nationally. That people are looking in and learning from what's happening right here. And man, it's brilliant. So it's a huge privilege for me to come and be able to share with you guys. And you're awesome. Keep it up. And yes, I spend a year with Dominic (laughs) in a grass hut in Vanuatu. And I have great stories and pictures. (laughs) Sometime I'll bring pictures. Okay, so I'll give you one story. Um, When Dom was there, he got sick. And it's tropic sick, not the flu or the sniffles, it's the plague. So I'm in this little 10-foot hut with him. I started worrying like, is he going to kill me? I'm going to get what he has. So it's just getting worse and worse. So he goes into town, which is a 15-kilometer hitchhike. That's what you, we had no running water, we had no electricity, you had to hitchhike into town. So he hitchhikes into town, goes to the hospital, they draw blood for a test, comes home. Day one goes by, no word. Day two goes by, no word. Day three goes by, no word. Day four goes by. Day, a week goes by, and the whole time, I'm in this room with Dom, and he's getting sicker and sicker. He's not even getting out of bed. And I knew we had to do something because at... Uh, one night, dark. In Vanuatu, it gets dark. We had no electricity, so there's no light. So at about 2 a.m., in our little grass hut, I see this hovering light right in the middle of our hut. And I knew it wasn't an angel or Jesus because I heard groaning and shuffling. And I'm like, Dom, what are you doing? This was his answer. I don't know. <laughs> I said, Dom, go back to bed. Okay. So he goes back to bed. The next morning I realized, this is serious. So I get the other two guys together, Josh and Dave. I said, we got to do something. We got two choices here. Either we go old yeller with Dom and just put him out of his misery. (laughs) Which was a dilemma for me because I could end up with my own hut. I'm wicked and evil. Or the other was, we have to get him back to the hospital. So Josh grabbed Dom and he took him back to the hospital. He gets to the hospital. When he gets there, the hospital's like, oh, Dom, great to see you. Dom's like, why? And they're like, well, we got your blood test back last week. You have cerebral malaria. Now, if you know malaria, there's the kind that you can get, you just keep having. It's called reoccurring malaria. It doesn't kill you, it just makes you sick. Cerebral malaria, malaria kills you typically in about two weeks. Dominic had it for two weeks, right? So if it doesn't kill you, it does kind of change your brain a bit. (laughs) Especially your humor. (laughs) Blame it on malaria, okay? (laughs) So Dom's like, why didn't you tell me? The hospital's like, wow, what a great idea. If someone has a fatal disease, we should tell them. Thanks, Dom. (laughs) So he got healed, and I think partly because of me. (laughs) That I saved Dom's life. (laughs) Yeah, pretty sure. So now I get to come up here, and you guys are blazing through the Psalms, and it's awesome. You're learning that the Psalms are these, they're they're like these emotional, power-packed little songs or prayers that if you study them, you really get a PhD in life. That's what they give you. They're incredible. And a lot of them start dark, but they progress into the light. And they give you hope. And they remind you that God is our king and our warrior and our refuge and our strong tower and our shepherd and that our cup runs over. And surely, goodness and mercy will follow us like tag your it. And man, we need that, don't we? But what about when that doesn't happen? 
What about when it feels like God is actually against you? What about when you go on the mission field for God and you get cerebral malaria and almost die? And there's no light, not even a tiny Timex light when it's just dark. Is there a psalm like that? There is. It's Psalm 88. It's the darkest psalm in all the psalms. And I'm going to read it for you, and we're going to talk about it. So Psalm 88, verse 1. O Yahweh, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more. For they have cut off your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your ways. Think about that. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made it, me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Yahweh. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Think about it. Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Yahweh, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O Yahweh, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted. And close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friends to shun me. And darkness has become my only friend. Merry Christmas. <laughs> this guy needs a hug, doesn't he? Let me give you a hug, bro. The author of this psalm, He-Man, is emotional. He is angry. He's complaining. He's bitter. He's blaming God for all of his problems. There's no light in it. There's no hope in it. There's nothing good. The last word in the psalm is, in the Hebrew, darkness. That's how it ends. It's the only psalm like it. And it is my favorite psalm, which will tell you a little bit about me. I love this psalm. You know why? Because I've lived through it. I've been in verse 8 where it feels like God has shut me in and I cannot escape. I've been in dark times. And so what I've done over the course of time is I've actually grabbed this psalm and I'll meditate on it, chew on it. And I started to write out the reasons why I love Psalm 88. I got a bunch of them. I'm going to give you four today. And I hope you will love Psalm 88 like I do because I think it's a brilliant masterpiece. Reason number one why I love Psalm 88 is I love its honesty. Verse one tells us that the author, he says this, O Yahweh, God of my salvation. 
The author of this psalm is a believer in Yahweh, a believer in the creator, a believer in Jesus. He's a believer, right? This is not an angry unbeliever's rage against God. This is a desperate believer's plea for him to come near and to hear. That's what this psalm is. And I'm gonna guess that the majority of you in here today are believers, that you believe in Jesus. And if you have believed in Jesus, you know that there is a time in our faith where it's like life looks rose-colored. You open the Bible and you read it, and it's like every verse is your favorite verse, that God is alive and he's speaking to you, and you're like, yes! You wake up with a question in your mind, like, what about that? And you turn on the radio and they're discussing that exact question. You're like, God, you're doing this all for me. Yes. You go to the coffee shop and you sneeze and someone says, God bless you. And you're like, yes, he has. Man. Yeah. And those are great times. But they don't always last. They don't always last. In Psalm 88, it's really honest about the walk of faith. It's really honest that there will be dark times. There will be times when you read your Bible and it doesn't feel like you get anything out of it. There will be times when you're praying and it feels like the heavens are closed to you. Like you can't hear, you can't see. There'll be times like that. Where the questions that you have, you're not getting answers for them. Instead, they seem to clog up the river of life and your, your spiritual life is just stagnant. And what Psalm 88 tells me is this, you're normal. I'm normal. That happens. See, I thought something's wrong with me if I'm going through this. And what Psalm 88 told me is, uh-uh, you're normal and it's okay. And I love Psalm 88 because it's honest like that. It's honest about this walk of faith. But there may be dark times. I love it number two because it's pure. It's pure. Here's a man, verse two. God, you're the God of my salvation. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. He's praying. Verse 13, in the morning I pray to you, but verse 14, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Here's a man who was praying and he's desperate for God and he's crying out to God. But all he gets is, verse 18, darkness. God used to be his companion. God used to be his shepherd. God used to be his strong tower. God used to answer his prayers. And now he's getting nothing. He's getting nothing. But here's what I love. Even though this man is getting nothing from God, he perseveres, he prays, and he stays. That's what he does. Even though he's not being downloaded, he's not feeling like God's blessing him, he doesn't feel God's favor, favor he stays. That's huge. This man is not praying to rub the God genie so the God genie will give him three wishes. He's not doing it. He's getting nothing from this, and he continues to pray. What Psalm 88 is, it's the book of Job in cliff notes. That's what it is. You know the book of Job. The whole accusation of the Satan in chapter one is, God, Job only serves you because you're his sugar daddy, because you give him all this stuff. If you stop giving him all that stuff, he would curse you to your face. That's the book of Job. Everything's taken from Job, right? That's the book. That's Psalm 88. This man, even though he's getting nothing from God, he continues morning after morning to come to God. If you want to know spiritual warfare, it's Psalm 88. It's Psalm 88. If you can walk through darkness and continue to come and continue to pray and continue to persevere, Satan has nothing left. It's when you crush him under your feet, 
Romans 16, 20. It's when you can walk through Psalm 88 and say, it does not matter that I'm getting nothing from this right now. I will stay and I will pray and I'll persevere. The enemy loses every weapon against you. That's what happens. It's brilliant. It's pure. That the darkness did not drive this author away from God. The darkness made him desperate for God's life and God's light. That's what it made him desperate for. Oh, that's spiritual warfare. It's pure now. I love it because it's honest. I love it because it's pure. I love it, number three, because it tells me God is safe. Psalm 88 is this emotional, just outpouring of desperation and blame against God. And it tells me something about God. It tells me he can handle it. So put yourself just for a moment in God's spot. Let's imagine you see one of your friends on whatever, Facebook or Instagram, or they do a Snapchat, a Snapchat. <laughs> I don't even have a cell phone. So, <laughs> so you see this desperate plea for help. And so this is a good friend, so you say, I'm gonna go over there and see if I can help him or help her. And you go to their house and the, the lights are off and you just hear groaning and moaning. And you go in and you try to console this person and all they do when you get in there is they begin to blame you for everything. You're the reason I'm in this. You're the reason my friends don't like me anymore. You're the reason I lost my job. You're the reason my spouse divorced me. You're the reason I have cancer now. Like, they just start to blame you for everything. Would you go and post that conversation on Instagram? Man, I had a great conversation with my bro. Kind of went like this. Kind of went like Psalm 88. What does God do? When this author pours out all this rage against him, is God like, what did you say? Oh, hell for you, young man. <laughs> no, what does God do? God grabs it and posts it in sacred scripture. God grabs it and he posts it for people to read, for you and me to read. How incredible is that? It means, it means God is safe. God is super safe. It means that God is not your God because you write glowing things about him. God is not your God because you can paste a smile on your face, and keep the rules. That's what it means. It means God is your God because he loves you and his grace is greater than you. And it means that even if you lose it, like Psalm 88, God's not gonna get rid of you. That's what it means, that he is safe. Do you realize how liberating and how free that is, how safe God is, how he really becomes your strong tower then? how you can run to him and you can bring all that you have to him and you can pour it out to him and he's not going to reject you. Do you know how strong that is in liberating? Like if we were Pentecostal, we'd shout right now. <laughs> but we're not. So smile. <laughs> this is huge because I think there is in every human heart this fear. If you're really honest with God, he would reject you. There's almost this idea that, you know, God tolerates me right now, Matt Heverly 1.0. But when I can get to 3.0, then God will be like, good job, Matt, now you're in. That there's this future version of me that God loves and accepts. And he just tolerates me right now. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let me try to illustrate it with my youngest son. His name is Myron. I have five kids. Myron about this time last year, three years old, my wife actually went for a, a run and she had, we had two extras at that time, so she took them with them. They got tired and so I went and picked up those two and I came home this Saturday morning and I knew how far away my wife was. She was about five miles away, so I knew it would take her about 10 minutes to run home. <laughs> you guys got it, good for you. So I get home with the other two and I get there and Myron's up and he's just gone to the bathroom. He's three years old, so I have to help him. He, he went number two, so I needed to help him. So I wait and wait and wait and he's done. I go, okay, Myron, buddy, let, let me help you. He's on the seat. He crosses his arms and he says, not you. 
I want mommy. I'm like, buddy, let's be reasonable here. Mommy's five miles away. She's running here right now. So th that's going to be a little while, all right? So just let me wipe you. Not you. I want mommy. I'm like, buddy, listen, this is not a gift that you are holding on to to present to mom when she gets home, okay? I lost the lottery, all right? This is not like, you're gonna bless mom, okay? Just let me take care of you, and then you'll be done, you can get off the toilet. Not you. I want mommy. Okay, fine. 20 minutes he sat on that seat. All right, buddy. I tried, all my skills of persuasion did not work, okay? To this day, Myron gets out of his bed at 2 a.m., crawls into my bed. He doesn't understand the idea of parallel sleeping. That like, if we each sleep parallel, there's plenty of room in our bed, man, it's a king size. No, he turns sideways. His feet are always headed toward me. The moment my body just touches his feet, he goes, thumper the rabbit on me, bang, 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 bang. I'm like, ah, I'm surprised I haven't lost a kidney. Okay? But listen, I can't imagine loving my son Myron more than I do right now. I'm not waiting for him to use the toilet correctly. I'm not waiting for him to stop kicking me in the bed. I'm not waiting for him to bench press 300 pounds. The 220 he pushes right now is fine. <laughs> I'm not waiting for him to know me better or have some kind of theology about me or say glowing things about me. I'm not waiting for that. I love him because he is my son. And what God says to you and me is, I love you because I love you. And Psalm 88 is not gonna change that. Never, because my grace is greater than that. He is safe. Give me your worst, Matt. I can handle it. I love Psalm 88 because it's honest and it's pure and it tells me God is safe. And then lastly, I love Psalm 88 because God uses it. God uses this psalm. He, man, the author, raw, desperate, emotional, depressed, pours out everything on a piece of scroll, just pours it out. And God grabs that what He-Man had poured out onto this scroll. And God says, I want that. I'm gonna put it into my book. It's gonna be a bestseller. You're gonna be one of the authors. God grabs a hold of it. Now think for a second. When He-Man was writing out all his rage against God, do you think he was thinking to himself, I'm writing the Bible right now. This is awesome. No way, right? He didn't think he was writing the Bible. He didn't think, hey, in 2,500 years, there's going to be this really awesome guy named Matt Heverly. This will be his favorite psalm. <laughs> There'll be all these people in Portland that gather around on August 12, 2018, and they will study what I'm writing right now. No. He was in dark desperation when he authored this psalm. Okay? And here's the whole thing. God couldn't tell him. Oh, if you only knew, he man. If you only knew the masterpiece you're penning right now. God couldn't tell him because if God did tell He-Man, hey, you're writing the Bible, what would He-Man do? He'd sanitize it. He'd change it. Oh, I can't write that. That's too harsh. It, it would ruin it. Masterpieces like Psalm 88 can only be written in the dark. They can only be written in the dark. God can't tell him God can't tell us or we'd ruin it. So it's this dilemma. It's the dilemma of Psalm 88. That God looks at you and me and he says, I want to take your life and I want to author some masterpiece with it. I want to make you Ephesians 2.10 into my workmanships, my poems. But I can't tell you that's what I'm doing because it would ruin it. It's a dilemma God's in. And the problem with you and me is this. We want to be those masterpieces, but most of us are afraid of the dark. We want God to do this great thing in our life, 
but we also fear him. We're afraid of him. We're afraid that if we wholly gave our life to Jesus, to God, what would he do with our life? Most Christians are afraid of that. And so we're like, well, just give you a little bit, God, that's it. Because we fear what he might write. I'll prove it. Let's say you knew that God was calling you to leave Westside and leave Portland and leave the United States and leave family and leave friends and leave community and leave job and leave security and leave retirement and leave all that and move from here down to the Amazon basin. Who here would say, dude, sign me up, raise your hand. Why not? Because we're afraid. We're afraid of what that might look like. Ooh, that could be dark. That could be hard. I don't actually trust God. I don't trust God that way. If I was holy to abandon my life to him, I'm not sure what kind of dark thing might be penned with my life. It might be a masterpiece, but I'm afraid. To everyone that did not raise their hand, you're in good company. Because if you read the Bible, what you find is a bunch of people that God called were like, not me. Please don't choose me. Moses is called by God. What does he do? I can't talk right. Um, I get this speech impediment. Choose somebody else. Right? God has to like, deal with him for like chapters in order to get him. Come on, dude, you're doing it. Jeremiah is called. Jeremiah 1.6. He's like, I'm too young. I'm not old enough yet. I'm still working on my PhD. Don't choose me. Choose somebody else. Ezekiel is chosen to be God's prophet. Outside of Babylon, there was this refugee camp that a sewage canal ran right through. And Ezekiel's called to be the man to preach to that community. And it says in Ezekiel 3.15, after he'd been called, he sat astonished for seven days straight. Uh, right, man, me, why me? How about Jonah? Was he stoked? No, he ran away. Because... We want these masterpieces authored, but most of us are afraid of the dark. We're afraid of Psalm 88. You could add my list, name to that list. I am the most reluctant minister in the history of the church. Me. Like I knew early on that I was called to do what I'm doing right now. I can remember distinctly, eight years old at this tiny 40-person, hyper-legalistic church sitting there watching Pastor Floyd preach a message telling us all the things that we couldn't do. Don't watch movies, don't eat sugar, don't, you know, be vegetarian, you know, don't watch those kind of, or don't watch those kind of shows, don't have a TV, don't, like just the list was huge in that church. And I remember thinking to myself, one day I'll do that. One day I'll stand in front of people and tell them everything they can't do, it'll be awesome. <laughs> Cannot wait for that. But I went Jonah style, ran from that. And I have this book from high school where they ask you these questions as a senior, like, you know, where are you going to be in five years? All these kind of questions. And I went back to it a couple of years just to see, like, what I'd written. Man, it was so discouraging. What you write as an 18-year-old is just ridiculous. It's so stupid. Like, come on. So, so my buddies are like, oh, in five years, I'm going to be working at a nonprofit. I'm going to be over here. I'm going to be traveling. Mine, what I said as an 18-year-old was this. In five years, what are you going to be doing? Making lots of money. That was it. I'm like, ah, you moron. Man, everyone has one of these books and they can look at, oh, Matt was a moron. That was my thing. So I went to Oregon State University and graduated as a mechanical engineer. And 95, I graduate. And I'm just thinking about how do I make lots of money? And I got this call. He was a friend. He said, hey, Wilderness Trails is doing this thing and they need help tomorrow. And this is before Google. So I'm like, what is Wilderness Trails? And my buddy said, it's this organization that takes foster care kids, teens, and takes juvenile hall kids, kids that are in like juvie prison, and boys' home people, and it takes them up into the Sky Lakes Wilderness for like a five-day trip up there where they see God's creation, and you just get to interact with them. And this is what I said to him. I said, why would you want to do that? <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a horror film. Someone's going to die, man. Someone's just going to get killed. <laughs> You're going to wake up when those kids are just like, ah, I'm like, no. <laughs> but for some reason I did it. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm not doing anything. I'll go. I think more for the hike than anything. And so I get up there and I'm with these 12 kids. I got 12 kids with me. 
And they had all kinds of issues. And I was part parent and part parole officer and part policeman. And when it was all done, I was ready to, to depart. I'm done. But there's something good that happened. Like I was alive in a way that I hadn't been alive in a while. And my heart was stirred. It was like I was coming out of a dark time. It was huge. And then a couple years later, this young man comes running up to me and he just embraces me. It was this young man from the Pitchford Boys Home that had been on that first trip with me and now he was following Jesus and he says, my life has been transformed. I remember thinking, that's it. That's it. So I'm like, okay, fine, God. Here's what I'll give you. All right? I'll go to the school of ministry, which was a discipleship thing at the church I was going to. I'll go to the school of ministry and then when I graduate, I'll teach the Bible to high schoolers. So I'll teach the Bible, and I'll go like to Lake Shasta and hang out with them. I'll do that for you, God. That's what I'm going to give you? <laughs> All right. All right, so I go to the school ministry. Uh, time's up, and I'm like, God, whatever. I'm not going somewhere weird. I'm not going somewhere where they eat bugs. Don't make me do that. So at the end of the school, school ministry, I get called in. They say, hey, you know, we have an opportunity for you. I'm like, yeah, youth pastor, sign me up. <laughs> Lake Shasta, let's do it. Like, no, no, we want you to go to Vanuatu. I said, that sounds way too close to I don't want to. Okay? <laughs> do they eat bugs there? No! Okay, but they do eat bats. What? That's worse! Right? And I wrestled with God so bad. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. And I went. And it was hard. And there were dark times. But I'll tell you, it was the best year of my unmarried life. It was brilliant. It was like nothing else. So I'm like, okay, God. All right, fine. So we plant Edgewater. And Edgewater, I'm like, okay, now I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm teaching the Bible. I don't want to do any of that weird stuff. I just want to teach the Bible and study. That's what I want to do. Well, five years ago, we had foster care just thrust on us. Like a family member, they, they, they lost their kids, they got into drugs, and, and it went south, and they had two kids, and, and no other family would take them, and, and it was like us. We were it. I'm like, what? God, well, no, this isn't part of the plan, right? I've got five kids of my own. I'm going to have seven kids in my home, right? It's a little three-bedroom. That was me like a refugee camp. Come on, God. <laughs> I mean, really? But it was like, I, was, I felt like, verse 8. I'm shut in. I cannot escape. There was no other option. I'm like just backed in a corner. Really, God? Okay. And they were from a different tribe. Man. Like we had to teach them what a fork was. This is a fork. You use it to put food in your mouth, not your hand. Right? It was that level. And we're with them for about a year. And something began to soften in me. I'm like, oh, Okay. This is good. My wife and kids were on board. They were going for it. They were, I was a reluctant one, drug into it. But then it felt like th this is really important. And we had, right after them, two other boys come through. Arrow and Terrain Strike. Arrow Strike is his name. How cool of a name is that? <laughs> right? The Indonesian boys, man, we love them. And they were with us for about a year. And, and it looked like they were going to go back to family. And we're so excited because we always try to work with the family. We, we think that's the best. But then their family just crumbled. And I was like, oh, no, what do we do? Do we adopt? And our good friends who had already adopted a boy said, we want the three musketeers. We want to adopt those two. I'm like, really? And so now they've just adopted Aaron Torrey, and now, now we get to be like aunt and uncle to these two boys that stay with us for a year. So they come over, and we high-five them and feed them lots of sugar and then send them home. <laughs> Have fun. And so I'm like, okay, God, fine. We'll do foster care. Great. We'll do it. And this time last year, August 15th, we got a call. It was from DHS. They said, hey, we have a unique opportunity, which is always dangerous. <laughs> we have a three-year-old who has a bite mark in his face, and his little brother was just born, born this morning. And he's in the NICU because he's addicted to heroin. He's a drug baby. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. Not a drug baby. No, I am 45 years old. I can't do that, God. And my wife... 
And my kids are like, we've got to do this, dad. I'm like, no, we are not. And they're like, you're a pastor. You should be doing this. I'm like, I quit, okay? Fine. <laughs> and they won. And so Harry came into our life. And oh man, I've raised five babies. There's nothing as hard as a drug baby. My wife spent herself on that boy. Spent herself. He wouldn't sleep more than two hours just because of what's happening in his system. And he was up all the time and, and he, just hard nights, super hard nights. And she's been like the rocket boost for him to give him everything he did not have in the womb. And doctors were like, he is thriving. What are you guys doing? I'm saying, I'm feeding him creatine, but other than that, I don't know. <laughs> and he has this unbelievable laugh. Like, unbelievable. In fact, I have a video of it. It's so good. So uh, he's out of the foster care system, back with family. So we have permission now to show this. I'm <laughs> laughing. Oh, it's so crazy. Hey, hey. Hi, buddy. Hi. <laughs> She's ready. <laughs> That's Harry. And he would do this thing. I would come home for work and I'd open the door, and I'm dad to him. He's the only dad he's, he, he, he'd known at that point. I'm dad. And so he'd see me, and, and he would just start walking across our floor, and he would do that laugh, just laughing. And then he'd come right to my foot, and then he'd raise up one hand like this, and then I'd just grab him and scoop it up. He was a nestler. And he'd nestle down into my neck, and he'd just grab the hold of my heart. Like, I, I, like I can't even imagine. Like I never thought I would adopt, but I would totally adopt now. And what has happened is, is, yeah, hard, yeah, difficult, yeah, Lord, I don't want to do that. But man, the masterpiece that's happening, the brilliance, like it's unbelievable. Wow. Wow. God, why am I so afraid of the dark when you write such good things in the dark? Why am I so afraid to give myself wholly to you? Why? Because every time I have, what has happened has been brilliant. And so I'm just trying to say, God, can I trust you more? Because I know you author such brilliant things when I trust you. When I trust you. You can trust him. You can really trust God. That what he wants for you and me is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. But he can't tell us. We're doing it. So we have to trust him. And you guys, I know on Sundays, you come to the table. The table, there's no better example than the table. Jesus went through darkness, did he not? Matthew 27 tells us the lights turned out, the sun went dark. Now, did Jesus do anything to deserve that darkness? No. And you might be in a dark time right now. That does not mean you did something to deserve it. It's just part of the walk, part of the way that God authors masterpieces, part of the way God gets the Psalm 88s in us is through darkness. But because of that, the greatest thing ever, the greatest masterpiece ever was authored, redemption and new creation. And here's what Revelation 21 tells us about new creation. It says that there's coming a time when there will be no more night. No more darkness. That you and I, God's masterpieces, are finally finished and we don't have to go through darkness anymore. That ultimately, resurrection brings light. And that's our hope. This is why I love Psalm 88. Love it, because it's honest. And it's pure. It tells me God is safe. It tells me God will use it in ways that I can't even understand. So when you come to the table, just pray one thing. Can I trust you more?
Can I raise my hand next time someone asks that? Can I trust you more? Because what he wants to author is brilliant. Would you stand with me as we pray?